I'm going to dive into John. Uh, we've been going through this. Jackie's kind of given us uh, the introduction and the overview. And if we're going to actually get through the book of John, we got a lot of ground to cover. We got to cover chapters two through four today. So buckle in. We'll be done about noon. Um, no, there's no way we could do all that. We are going to cover that chapter or those chapters. But part of this really is, I want to continue to encourage us in the Genesis series. We said, we hope this encourages you to get that Bible off the shelf, dust it off, uh, dig it out of your, get the app on your phone and be reading. And so um, in light of that, we're going to cover these chapters, but I'm just going to give you a couple little things to, as you're reading, check this out, Okay. So we've finished chapter one. We're headed into chapter two. Chapter two uh, starts off with a relatively common, well-known story. If you've been around church, if you've been around the Bible and stuff, you know the wedding um, story. This was the first sign. John chapter two, verse 11 says, this is the first sign that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifests his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the story where he turns the water into wine. Right? <clears throat> so as you go back and read this, I want you to think about this question. What is the glory that was manifest in this miracle? And here's a hint. If you think it just simply is that it shows he has the power to turn water into wine, uh, make sure you go back and read what he tells his mother. Aaron's paraphrase is, he tells mom, I'm not a magic show, right? So as you read it though, try and answer that question. What is this glory? What is the purpose of that story? What is Christ trying to reveal as he does turn water into wine? What is this glory that gets manifest? Um, so you get to read that one on your own and there's your, your, your questions to do that in your own personal discipleship. The next section, uh, we see Jesus prophesy. Do you know Jesus was a prophet? He does. He says, this is what's going to happen. Watch for it. He says, I'm destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. He, and that later in that verse, he says he was speaking about the temple as of his body. When therefore, when he was raised, his disciples would remember this and see. So he sets a prophecy forward. So that's the next little section in the end of chapter two, chapter three, uh, we get this famous story where Jesus teaches one of the teachers. How many of you remember or draw the parallel that one of the most, if not the most famous verse of the Bible falls in the middle of this teaching? John 3.16 is a part of the story and the teaching that Jesus is giving to Nicodemus. It's kind of interesting. I, I, I don't always think about that, but... It's right there. That's a part of this teaching that he's giving to Nicodemus. Another thing that I really would love for you as you read through that, because we're not going to spend a lot of time here today, um, we're just going to spend this little bit of time, is hindsight is twenty twenty. In it, it talks about, Jesus says, if the Son of Man uh, be lifted up, or that uh, the Son of Man must be lifted up as the bronze snake was lifted up. And when we look back, we can very easily see the parallel between the story of the bronze snake, which happens in Exodus, and you can go back and look at that one. But in it, there's a plague of snakes, and God says, Moses, build this bronze snake, put it on a pole. If people look at it, they will be healed. Um, and Jesus in this teaching says, likewise, the Son of Man must be lifted up. As we look back, we see immediately the parallel between the bronze snake and Jesus on the cross. But Jesus on the cross hadn't happened yet. So that's not exactly the parallel that Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus to draw. He's asking Nicodemus to draw a different kind of parallel. Um, so have a little fun, dig into that. What is the parallel that he's asking Nicodemus to look at in regards to the bronze snake? Um, so Nicodemus comes and then, uh, as we continue through three, uh, we end up the end of that chapter, uh, talks about John the Baptist again. And John the Baptist talks about his legacy as his disciples were coming and they're talking about Jesus. John answers and says, 
A person cannot receive unless one cannot receive even one thing unless it is given from heaven. And here's what I must do is I must he must increase and I must decrease. John's talking about his legacy. What is it that he wants and thinks needs to be remembered? So it's a nice, interesting little story. Look at, again at that. Which brings us to today. We're going to look at chapter 4. And this is probably chapter 4, one of the most theologically compact. I mean, there's so much in this story. I love this story. We hear this all the time. We hear the story of the woman at the well. Um, it, again, is another really popular one. We hear it applied to all kinds of different things. And there's so much. This is one of the richest stories, I think, uh, in, in, in Scripture. Because there's so much that's packed into this. We could sp- I could spend, I don't know, weeks and weeks and weeks just on this section. We're not going to do that. We're going to rush through this a little bit. But I do want to kind of re-envision it a little bit. Most often when we think of the story of the woman at the well, we think of this story of the woman who comes and um, because of when she comes and because of what is said later on, we think of her as kind of an outcast. Um, It's often said that she might have been a prostitute, a sinner uh, kind of a thing. But I want to put us into a little bit of a different spin on this. Ephraim Smith, who uh, those of you who are Uber Covenant uh, might remember that Ephraim was once our superintendent. Uh, He is now pastoring up in Sacramento. Um, He wrote a book called Killing Me Softly. Um, I'm not going to sing the Roberta Flack song. Um, Actually, it was written by another lady, uh, Lori Lieberman. Um, You young folks don't know who any of those people are, uh, but you might recognize uh, Lauren Hill, uh, who has done the song most recently. Um, there's another a cappella group that does it. And like I said, I'm not going to sing it for you. But in it, Ephraim Smith looks at the story and he says, I'm not sure that this was that kind of marginalized individual. And as I not only read through what Ephraim uh, wrote in his book, but uh, listening to his sermon and really beginning to look at, I read some stuff from Jewish readings. And they don't quite see it the same way. Killing Me Softly, the song, it just talks about uh, the, the story behind the song was that uh, she was sitting at a Don McLean concert and hearing him talk about her life and how he just came into touch and understood her pain. And I think that's kind of the picture that we see in this. That's the way I want to kind of revision this a little bit. Um, it's not this, it's not just that he reached out to some outcast, but he reached out and touched her pain. And maybe her pain wasn't her sin. And we're going to look at that a little bit. So we're going to read through this and I'll kind of, as we read through it, you'll begin to see some of these things where we might begin to see some of this. So I'm going to highlight some of the Jewish aspects to this. So we're going to start John chapter 4, starting at verse 1. We're going to go through 42 verses. There is a chunk that we're going to kind of skip over a little bit, but let's just walk through this. John chapter 4 verse 1 says, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus didn't actually do the baptizing, his disciples were the ones doing it, he left Judea And departed again for Galilee. And he passed through Samaria. So he came to the town of, uh, he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, weary from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, there's some significant things in this as we read through this that we go, okay, yeah, that's really nice. It gives us the location and all that kind of stuff. But to a first century Jewish reader, there's some pretty strong significance to this location. It says that it was at Joseph's well. Well, for the Samaritan Jews, and I say that because as I begin to read and understand the history and the complexity of it, um, that's kind of the way that they saw it. 
the Samaritans didn't see themselves as separate. They saw themselves as Jews. But the Judeans, these elite of class, saw them as uh, half because they believed something a little bit different. They didn't believe that the temple was the center of worship. They believed that the mountain where Jacob dug and lived and set the well was the center of God's interaction with humanity. And so they argue back and forth. This is one of the main reasons why the Jews hated the Samaritans. The Jews being actually this ruling class. The Samaritan group wasn't, didn't see themselves as separate. One of the readers I was looking at said, it's akin to what we see today in our Muslim communities. We look at Muslims and we see Sunnis and Shiites. And we go, they're Muslims. But if you ask a Sunni or a Shiite, they're going, nope, we're completely different. That's kind of the same idea with these Jews versus Samaritans. When we actually look at them from the outside, they actually are keepers of the law. They're followers of Torah. They're, they're devoted to Moses. But they saw themselves as different because of this worship piece, and they hated one another for it. But when, you, when a Jew would read this, they're going, wait a minute. Jacob's well is significant. That represents the living water that God brings to life. Not only was it the well, but it says that it was the place that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. This was the place that Joseph was buried. Joseph was buried very close by. And so for a first century Jew in that time and and space, this was a reminder. They would recognize that this was a place that that living water would give restoration to the suffering. The Jews recognized Jacob's story and the story of suffering, that unnecessary suffering. He didn't deserve the suffering that he went through at the hand of his brothers. And yet, God was there with him in the midst of that. This is the picture of where Jesus, to a first century Jew, this is the picture of where Jesus is at when he starts to say this. This is the context. The other little thing is often we see that sixth hour and we say, well, see, it's late in the day. And that becomes part of why we say she, was a, she might have been an, a social outcast because she, because she came at the sixth hour. Um, maybe. Uh, if we remember back to Genesis, Rachel came to the well at the sixth hour as well. And she wasn't coming because she was a prostitute. And so um, there's the, the Jewish rabbi that I was reading through said uh, that actually... May not, uh, that could be a relatively common thing because it doesn't say it was summer. It doesn't say that it was the hot hour. And Rachel came at that time too. So it doesn't really give us that indication. Not that she was. You know, I'm not trying to say that way we thought about it was wrong, but just some interesting things in that context of how a first century Jew might be reading this at this point. So let's read on. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, and in the Hebrew, this is actually you, a Judean. She was calling a very specific Jew. One who is a Judean, who believes that the temple is the center. How is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is, who it, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would give, you would ask him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well to drink from, as, as did his sons and his livestock. Again, in there, she's responding because in her mind, this is sort of re- Jacob's well represents living water, the way in which God provides. Who are you saying that you're going to provide this? I'm at Jacob's well. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again, but everyone who drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. 
The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said, give me, sir, give me this water so that I may not thirst or have to come to draw water. The Jewish author that I was reading this through, he says, we look at this and we see her kind of arguing, but again, if we think about where the symbolism of where they're at and why she's there, he's going, what if she's talking about her pain? What if she's coming because life's difficult? And we haven't heard yet about her husband's, which we often use to make the explanation that maybe she was a prostitute because she had multiple husbands. But this Jewish author says, what if she wasn't somebody who was sexually promiscuous and all that kind of stuff? Because in Jewish culture, women can't initiate divorce. It had to be the men. What if she's coming in because she's had multiple husbands and that kind of stuff because they've died? And she's coming and she's depressed and she's hurting. One of the things that I didn't mention before is that Sakar and this place is also a city of refuge. It was a refuge city in their time. Refuge not meaning that if you were under the under persecu uh, prosecution that you ran away, but just simply a place that if you were broken, if you were hurting, that's where you would go to find comfort and peace and rest. It was kind of a welfare city where if you needed things, you would go and you'd be taken care of. This is a woman who's coming from that place, from that space. What if she was not an outcast because of her sinful lifestyle, but what if she was an outcast just simply because her life had just beat her down? What if all of, she was a multiple time a widow and she's just coming depressed? <clears throat> These are a marginalized people. This is when Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come here. Then the woman answered him and says, I have no husband. Jesus says, you are right in saying that you have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you are with now is not your husband. What you've said is true. And look at the woman's response. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that we are to worship in Jerusalem. This place where people ought to worship. Where is this place that people are ought to worship? Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation does come through the Judeans. But an hour is coming, and this is one of my favorite phrases, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God's, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak am he. These are some of my favorite passages. These are some of my favorite verses. In terms of that song, part of what Ephraim Smith says, and even this Jewish author, he says, this was Jesus seeing her pain. And not only did he see her pain, but he calls it out. You're right. You don't have husbands. They've all died. And you're in pain. In fact, you're having to live with somebody just to make your existence, just to make it happen, just to live. The song says, strumming my pain with his words. And Jesus saw this woman. He saw her pain. He saw her hurt. And he calls that out. And he says, I see you. And the Messiah is here. 
a time is coming and has now come. This heartache, this hurt, he sees her, he speaks to it. And when, he, when she realizes who's standing before her, let's look at her response. Just then the disciples came back. They marveled at the woman who was talking to her, and no, <clears throat> but no one said it. What, what are you seeking, or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar, went away into the town, and said to the people, Come and see the man who has told me everything that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They, the town, went out of the town and they were coming to him. Many Samaritans from the town believed him because of a woman's testimony. He told me everything that I ever did. So the Samaritans came to him. We, sorry, we jumped over some verses in there. Um, there's a, a piece where the disciples have a conversation with Jesus trying to make him eat. And he says, I'm too busy to eat. I'm too busy. Don't have time to eat. But many of the Samaritans came because of her. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed for days. And many believed because of his words. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. We have heard for ourselves and we know this indeed about the Savior. We, had, we know indeed this is the Savior of the world. Does a woman who has a reputation for being a prostitute and sexually promiscuous have that kind of influence? It's one of the questions that the Jewish author brought up. He says, wait a minute, if we, if we read it as she's this prostitute, why would people even begin to listen to her? But if they know that she's a woman in pain and she's coming and she's sharing how the Messiah has touched her, has seen her pain and comforted her, they know her, they, this is one of their own, this is one of their friends, and they listen to her. They hear her and they say, let's go. Let's go hear this Jesus as well. Christ is here to touch our pain. And I'm not saying that the way we've read this scripture is wrong, that she's not a prostitute. She very well may have been. That's just as powerful of a story. Because sometimes we are, we're, we're the sinful ones and, and we need to know a Messiah that in spite of our sin will love us and reach out to us, will cross these boundaries and borders to touch us. That is true and an accurate reading of this passage. But I also think that this is an accurate reading of this passage, that this is a woman who is broken and hurting. She was there because she couldn't drag herself out of bed that morning because of the depression. She was an, a part of an outcast community. They all were marginalized and people, those are them. And this is the Jesus who comes and says, I see your pain. I know where you're at. I feel your heartache. And I want to offer you living water. Water that brings life. And life more, back in chapter three, abundant. Jesus is, is touching this person, strumming uh, the, the, the song again, killing me softly. This woman in that song is sitting there hearing these words and it's just touching her soul because you see my pain. You understand my hurt and you want to reach me. Some of us, that's where we're at. We need to know that there is a Messiah that wants to touch us that way. We live in a world that feels that, 
This is the mission. Jesus didn't want to just touch her heart and her life. He wants to touch every heart and every life on this globe. And there are people that are hurting and broken this way. Everywhere. And we as the church are his hands and feet. We are his body asked to carry that message to them, to be the ones to come to them, wrap them up in our arms and say, we love you. You're hurting. I love you. I'm not here to tell you what you've done wrong. I'm just simply here to love you. We'll worry about that later. I love you. We're his hands and feet. This is, not only are we doing that, but this is our mission. Evangelism is not complicated. If you've experienced this living water, share it. Tell somebody what God has done in your life, how God has reached in and met you. If you have experienced this, talk about it. If you haven't experienced this, God is asking for you. If you've experienced this and you're not sharing it, have you truly experienced it? This is mercy. This is grace. I'm going to close with this little video. It's a song um, that comes from a band called Beautiful Eulogy. And it actually is music. It's, a, it's a, another pastor talking about this experience, this love and mercy. You might be in the place where you need to feel that love and mercy today. You need to hear Jesus say, I love you. You're hurting, you're broken, and wrap his arms around you. Some of us are in the place that we've experienced that and we need to be told, then get out and share it. We're going to close with this really quick. Go ahead, Sam. Are you merciful? Why? Because Jesus healed the sick. Because Jesus fed the multitudes. Because Jesus gave legs to the crippled. Because Jesus granted sight to the blind. Because Jesus opened the ears of the deaf. Because Jesus found prostitutes and tax collectors and drew them into the sphere of his love. Because Jesus touched the untouchable and loved the unlovable and forgave the unforgivable and welcomed the undesirable. Because Jesus even now saves the otherwise unsavable. Why? Because they deserve it. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done in righteousness. Not because we met Him halfway. Not because we took the proper steps forward and in good faith have elevated ourselves to the place of the deserving poor, but according to His mercy. We are here because Jesus Christ didn't say with cold indifference, give them what they deserve. They brought it on themselves. Jesus Christ is the mercy of God. And seeing us in our misery and need, He doesn't just feel for us. He takes the necessary action to relieve our distress. He leaves the eternal glory of heaven and the perfect fellowship of the Trinity. He condescends to us, lives among us, suffers like us, dies for us. Do you understand this? Have you experienced this? Is it possible to experience it and not display it? It isn't possible. You haven't experienced it if you don't display it. The evidence of God's mercy in your life isn't determined by how much theology you know, by how many books you read, but by your active goodness to people in misery and in need. Blessed are the merciful, 
looking forward as we close this time in prayer. Regardless of whether this woman was a woman of ill repute or whether she just was broken. She was marginalized. She was an outcast. She was set aside. And Jesus comes and extends to her more than what she deserved or expected. He expressed to her mercy. If you need to feel mercy today, hear that. That this Messiah, this life, this Christ is about extending mercy and grace to you. If you've experienced that, man, that's powerful. Tell somebody. Let them know. Don't keep it quiet. Get excited. God wants to move in this world. And that's all you have to do is tell your story of how God touched you, is touching you. Let's close in prayer. Father, we do come. We thank you for sending your son so that these stories can be possible. You didn't just create a world and set it in motion and walk away. You are actively participating in the world today. You sent your son to pay the penalty, but not just the, to be the penalty, to pay that penalty, but to bring to us transformation. It is here, it is now. Heaven is not something we're going to get to. You brought heaven down. Heaven is now and it is in us. Those of us who are being transformed, who are living into your mercy, Lord. Lead us, teach us. Not for our sake. We must decrease that you will increase that you are glorified. Lord, teach us to be your light, to be your truth in the world today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.